Battle Royale is the rare work of live-action Japanese cinema that truly needs no introduction. It's been cited as a major influence by Quentin Tarantino, Edgar Wright, and many other visionary directors. It inspired, directly or indirectly, an entire wave of mediocre YA novels and Hollywood movies, and in recent times it's gone on to be the namesake of the most presently popular genre of online shooter. And that influence is well earned. Battle Royale's modern take on Lord of the Flies combines visceral action and drama with thoughtful commentary on Japan's strict, ultra-competitive school system, the viciousness with which some teachers tacitly encourage teens to treat each other, and the callous, inhuman way Japan's larger systems handle those who can't, for whatever reason, make the grade. Uh, naturally, the rotten old men that the film and original novel were criticizing didn't take too kindly to that, and either ignoring or intentionally misrepresenting its themes, many of the day's conservative politicians decried it as a piece of mindless, sensationalized murder porn that would destroy Japanese society. This, just as naturally, led to major countercultural pushback, cementing the film's status as a bona fide classic and cinematic touchstone. However, the dismissive narrative that people were just getting their sicko kicks from lurid depictions of teen-on-teen ultraviolence persisted, and as anime, manga, and games began riffing on the concepts Battle Royale helped popularize, as Japan's entertainment industries do, there would come a franchise that absolutely and categorically proved them at least partly right. Mirai Nikki, Future Diary, is one of those anime that only gets harder to understand the more you try to think about it. I mean, the god running the central survival game to select his own replacement is literally named Deus Ex Machina, which should immediately tell you everything you need to know about the level of writing you're dealing with here, but that god is also voiced by Norio Wakamoto, which should likewise tell you everything you need to know about the level of fun that was had turning the original manga into an anime. It's not a smart show, or a good one for that matter. There are many points where it attempts to unpack extremely sensitive subject matter with all the tact and grace of a bear going through garbage cans, and even if that doesn't bug you, on some level the borderline suicidal stupidity of its lead will. Not to mention its ending. Very little of this gets in the way of it being an absolute blast to watch in the moment, however. Thanks to its great voice cast, music, and the directing talents of Nalto Hosoda, who has a knack for finding the fun in any project he works on, even a low-rent gacha anime like Magatsu Warheit Zwerst. Despite being the poster girl for Anime Edge, Mirai Nikki actually sands down the harshest or least marketable edges of Battle Royale's conceit by expanding the Death Game roster to include a variety of colorful adult psychopaths on top of a handful of students, thus creating a sense of zany variety that both heightens the murdery fun and undercuts most potential controversies. There is a literal child who gets murked at one point, but he's a serial killer child, like that one baby from JoJo's, so it's totally okay. This inoffensively offensive tone has earned Mirai Nikki a great deal of success both in Japan and overseas, and that, of course, means that in the decades since it debuted, as many other anime and manga have followed in its bloody, stupid footsteps as those of Battle Royale. And I'm not gonna lie here, I kinda love all of them. Look, I'll never stop singing the praises of high-minded, intellectual, odd-taxi-type anime, but I wouldn't be in this business if I didn't want to have some silly, over-the-top fun, and nothing says silly, over-the-top fun quite like a big, dumb battle royale. The genre's premise promises to deliver both the catharsis of watching unpleasant things happen to unpleasant people, and the thrill of seeing somewhat likable characters to whom the target demo can relate beat overwhelmingly deadly odds not unlike the teen slasher flicks that proved so popular in America through the late 70s and 80s. The difference being that in battle royales and survival games, there's never just the one slasher. Every competitor is a potential killer, including the almost invariably wussy dork protagonist, who will just as invariably take some non-elective badass lessons from the school of hard knocks in the first act, joining the Freddy vs. Jason tournament arc as a major player by the story's midpoint. 
usually after losing a few of their saner, kinder friends. Again, like slasher movies, these stories tend to rely pretty heavily on formula, much of it derived from the successes of Mirai Nikki. Though in this specific tropes case, it's more a product of that show and manga's most notorious failing. Yukiteru Amino reminds me a lot of Shinji from Neon Genesis Evangelion. <whistles> wow. Only worse in every conceivable way and without a good story to excuse his actions. He spends almost the entire story letting his psycho stalker classmate drag him around, slaughtering dozens in his name, partly because he's terrified and partly because he's horny. And then, when he's finally ready to maybe make his own choices and do something good for once, he immediately gets tricked in the most agonizingly obvious way into making everything worse for everyone. Fuck Yuki, all my homies hate Yuki, just about everyone who's ever watched Mirai Nikki hates Yuki. Which is why every death game since then has strived to make its hero the anti-Yuki, at least in its back half. A wee bit of wussing about and hesitancy toward playing the game is almost always necessary on a protag's part to avoid painting them as a total psychopath, but we do want to see our heroes do more than cower in a corner while their fuck buddies fight their battles for them, so if Eventually, in the process of running away screaming, they'll need to discover some innate survival instinct or whatever that lets them excel in that game. Whether that be a Darwin's game, a magical girl raising project, or a Batum. Usually this'll come paired with some sort of drastic shift in their mental state. Batum's Sakamoto has a head injury that periodically sends him into a fugue state where he believes he's still playing the Bomberman meets Halo video game that the real-life death game is based on, thus allowing him to fully unleash his elite skills. In most cases, the hero will just become increasingly jaded and willing to kill in self-defense as they accept the horrible reality around them, with the caveat that their motivation is to ultimately defeat the people running the game rather than the people playing it, and end it with as few casualties as possible while holding on to what they value most. You know, the whole, despite everything, it's still you. In some cases, the attempts to cling to normalcy can come off as strange, given the circumstances. High Rise Invasion's Yuri Honjo and her lesbian battle buddy Mayuko fend off dozens of colorful, smiley, not ghost faces on their way through the empty office blocks and precarious rope bridges of the series' strange pocket dimension, eventually acquiring the power of literally God and an angel, respectively. Yet Yuri's chief motivation, above even ending the sick game in which they're trapped, remains constant, to reunite with her precious, cool Onisama and show him what a good Emoto she is. That is at least consistent with the series' general level of camp, though. Who the hell is that? When did they show up? The hell? Who is that? Those panties. And would you believe that's an upgrade to the typical standard of writing for women in these anime? See, Mirai Nikki's other most notable character was... Do I even have to tell you? There's a 99.9% .9 chance that you clicked on this video because Yuno Gasai is in the thumbnail. Even if you don't know who she is, you know the Yandere pose in The Yandere Lighting. She's a franchise transcending, whole show carrying icon. A bit flat in terms of actual personality, all her depth, if you can even call it that, is rooted in a childhood of endless, absurd abuse, but that works for the waifu Norman Bates thing she's got going on. The real problem is that, for obvious financial reasons, almost every anime and manga that tries to be the next Mirai Nikki also wants to have the next Yuno, which has led to an obnoxious trend of hack writers thinking that waifu design plus trauma equals compelling drama, and that the more traumatized ear they can make their murder waifus, the more moe they'll be. Sometimes this trauma will be related to the death game in some way, and thus actually help to drive the plot forward, Shuka in Darwin's game is ruthless to a point bordering on insanity due to her obsession with ending the game that killed her parents, for instance, but in most cases it's just an excuse to cram cheap, exploitative depictions of child abuse and a thing that will get me demonetized and rhymes with vape into flashbacks. Battle Game in Five Seconds of Meeting takes this, along with most 
of the genre's other tropes to a positively ridiculous extreme with its leading lady, Yuri Amakage. Her tragic backstory doesn't involve the R word, but does involve an abusive mother who hates her, hooking up with an abusive single dad who hates his daughter even more, and while Yuri's busy taking care of that little sister she never asked for, she also has to deal with a psycho stalker who eventually gets her dead, or isekai'd, or whatever's going on here. This has filled her with a righteous sense of rage and honed her survival instincts to a razor point, which, coupled with a special power that amplifies all her physical abilities fivefold, turns her into a killing machine. A talent she first demonstrates in a battle against a roided up ugly bastard that almost does involve the R word, but at least he gets what's coming to him almost immediately. Well, I say at least, but one of the two main goals of this formula is to set up moments like that. Not the specific creepy part, usually, but the general extreme circumstances that give secret monsters license to put their true selves out in the open, where they can then be sliced up, blasted, or slammed into a concrete wall of a parking garage at Mach 3. And you can just sit back, point, and laugh, confident that that guy deserved that on account of how the show told you he did. Typically, the battle royale protagonists who aren't every boy and murder girl will fit into two broad categories. On the one hand, you'll almost always have some criminals and social deviants brought in by the shadowy organizers to ensure that cooler heads don't prevail and the killing will commence as planned. Most of these will be jobbers who just barely menace the heroes in the very early stages of the show before they can grow and give them their comeuppance. But there will also be a few psychos and organizers criminal types scattered among them who stick around to provide longer-lasting threats and bridge the gap between that awkward beginning and the final confrontation with the true mastermind. The second category, which in some cases doesn't appear at all, is ordinary Japanese folk, many of whom will immediately crack under the pressure and either off themselves or become a liability, but a few, including Protag-kun, will prove to have unlikely skills that make them valuable allies, like, say, a business dude with a knack for diplomacy and strategy. Although if they don't give off shonen sidekick energy, they probably won't make it to the end. A few ordinary people with unexpected talents may also be driven to do bad things out of desperation, appearing at first blush to be indistinguishable from the psychos and gangsters until we learn their tragic backstories, at which point they'll either join the heroes, sacrifice themselves, or both. There will also generally be one or two normal people, usually popular charismatic types, who prove to have an even greater capacity for evil than any obvious villain, born from a combination of extreme stress and insert aspect of society that the author dislikes here. Uh, basically, the idea is to show us the darker side of humanity that gets brought to light in trying times, as well as ideologies and selfish motivations that can breed evil in all times, contrasted against the bright, optimistic, cooperative spirit embodied by the protagonist. And since almost every writer who actually understands people well enough to do that concept justice is working in shoujo romance, adult drama, or chainsaw man, the end result is usually... Master Aikawa supports the theory of eugenics. It effectively eliminates all those who are incompetent. Only the superior few will survive. Not good, nor smart, but fun. Even grandiose anime speeches accompanied by gratuitous anime violence can get boring after a fashion without some variety in that violence, but thankfully that's the other thing big dumb battle royales exist to justify. Mirai Nikki's titular Future Diary introduced a fun strategic twist to the basic idea of free-for-all murder contests, giving its characters something to worry about on top of guns and knives and bombs and shit, something akin to a shonen battle power system. And every show to follow in its footsteps has followed suit in some way. In Killing Bites, for instance, the one with the sharpest fangs wins, and those fangs are sharpened by hybridizing human beings with animal DNA to give them animal powers. How fun! Darwin's game bestows each player with a sigil that can grant any number of powers, from controlling trees to predicting the future to unlimiting blade works. Magical Girl Raising Project, true to its name, mixes the edgy death game trend with the edgy magical girl trend to equip its combatants with typical magical girl powers, which they must then use to magical splash flare the ever-loving heck out of each other. 
These combat twists don't always take the form of an explicit power system. In Batum, for instance, victims are forced to take part in a real version of a popular online combat game of the same name, where players must use 10 different kinds of bombs along with a 3D radar system to outsmart their opponents. Each type of bomb has distinct advantages, disadvantages, and use cases, and the radar system has its own quirks that have to be accounted for as well, resulting in fights with a distinct high level esports flavor. Now, I've made it very clear over the years how much I love anime fights, so perhaps it's unsurprising that all these varied methods of murder are the main thing that keeps me coming back to this weird, mostly bad subgenre. And despite the fact that it's one of the mostly baddest battle royales I've seen in quite some time, I'll admit I've been having a lot of fun with Five Second Battle Game for exactly that reason. Its hero is also a pro gamer whose chief strengths are strategizing and analyzing, but it actually gives its combatants supernatural powers, and his is to have whatever power his enemy thinks he has, which by itself opens up plenty of possibilities for mind games, and when you add to that his propensity for analyzing others' tactics and abilities and the possibilities of putting him in team battles lends the show a nice atmosphere of strategic tension. It's nowhere near as smart as as it wants you to believe, but none of these are, and the fact that it cuts all but the most basic gestures toward character development to get right into the action means it can offer a good amount of dumb fun per minute of screen time. Though, if I were actually seeking out a show like that to watch instead of just watching it because it's on, I'd probably settle for Juni Taizen as its crew of 12 mostly amoral mercenaries fuck around even less before they start finding out, and its animated action directed by, hey, Naoto Hosoda, is, at least in the early episodes, the most impressive and fun in this entire genre. It's also based on a book by Nisio Isin, who is very smart at writing dumb things, so if you want to enjoy one of these unironically, it's likely your best bet. I'd be remiss to end this video without at least noting that battle royale elements often crop up in shonen battle things, from One Piece to Naruto to Hiroaka to Hunter x Hunter, and that there are also less dumb battle royale anime, games, and manga like Eden of the East, Review Starlight, Fate, and Danganronpa, which actually do and say interesting things with the concept. But I'm kind of tired of talking about good anime lately, so I just wanted to talk about some bad ones today. Though I may use those in the future as a basis for discussing how this concept can be done well. Also, I didn't bring up King's Game because it's not really a battle series, and it really deserves its own in-depth roast. Until either of those happen, though, I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.